Well, good morning, and I pray that you are having a, a good morning. This is a, uh, a sermon that was prepared for Sunday, uh, August uh, the 23rd, for our morning worship time together. It is uh, the 17th in a series that I've been doing on the uh, book of, of Jeremiah. And this would be uh, Jeremiah's sermon number 17 under Right Now Media, under the church's library that is there. It is taken from Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 1 through chapter 19 and verse 15, and I uh, entitled it The uh, Potter's the Potter's House, as we begin to, to look at this message this morning. Now, a little bit of review, as we always do, in case you're, you're joining us uh, for the first time last time uh, in Jeremiah, to remind you, we, we looked at how um, the iniquities and the sins of the people had been written with an iron pen, which was the title of my message last time, how their destiny, their history, uh, would remain unchanged because they refused to listen and because they refused to turn or, or to change and to come back to God with their whole heart. Now, we also looked at the two religions that are in the world, man trusting in man, uh, the strength of his own right arm, his religion, his philosophies, his traditions, his works, as opposed to the other religion that is in the world, those who simply put their faith in God. And what he has done for them. Now God is going to instruct Jeremiah and the elders and the officials in Judah with a visual lesson. It's uh, one thing to be told. It's another to be shown. And this is God's love in trying to get through to them. It wasn't enough that Jeremiah stood in the temple and in the gates of the temple was preaching to them God's words. Uh, they weren't listening. But now he's going to show them what they weren't listening to about what was going to happen. So we have this visual aid in this story of the potter's the potter's house. So we begin reading in chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. And again, it's a visual message. This is a field trip. Come on, Jeremiah. Let's go down to the potter's house. And, and this is going to be a, a lesson you're going to be shown. So I went down to the potter's house. I saw him working at the wheel, the potter. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. It had a lumpy piece of clay or something in it that wouldn't yield to the potter's hand, an unyielding portion. So the potter formed it into another pot. I mean, if it doesn't become what the potter was shaping it to, he's just going to form another one. That has application to us today, too. Are we really, truly yielded into the potter's hands? So the potter formed it in another pot, shaping is it, it seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. She wouldn't be shaped into the nation that God would make her. So doesn't he have a right to do with her whatever he chooses to do because he's the potter and it's his clay? You know, the word yield, uh, I've told you before, is one of my, my, my favorite words. It's a verb, uh, and it's an active-passive verb. I don't know of too many words like that. It means to yield, that we're commanded to do, is to actively do nothing. It is to actively open up our lives like, like malleable clay and let God do with whatever He wants to do with us. Just yield into the hands of God. To submit to the potter, to yield into his hands. God the potter not only can fashion the clay the way that he wants it to be clay, but he can, he can, he can, we, we are made out of clay. Adama, uh, the red clay that God made Adam out of and named him after that red clay. And not only did he make the red clay that man was made out of and breathed into him life because God is life, he made everything else. Everything belongs to God. All matter, all things living, all things created. So doesn't he have a sovereign right to do whatever he wants to? And yet here we got clay on the potter's wheel arguing with him, 
not yielding to him? So doesn't he have a right to do with them what he pleases? In fact, Paul will pick up on this in Romans chapter 6 and verse 13. He says, Neither, here's that word, uh, paristomai, neither yield, like the clay, neither yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. Actively allow yourself to be molded, to be shaped by God with no hard lumpy parts that refuse to be molded to his hands. But rather yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. See, God gave you life to that clay. And if God did that for you, even in your sinfulness, Christ died for your sins, shouldn't you yield? Why rebel? As those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Romans 6.19 says, Speak after the manner of men, I speak after the manner of men, Paul says, because of the infirmity or the weakness of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and ye have no problem yielding to sin, yielding to the world, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now, yield your members as servants to righteousness and holiness. I mean, you got no problem you know, yield into the world to shape you and make you the way the world would have you to be like everybody else. But why not give yourselves into God's hand to shape you into a consecrated vessel of holiness to be used by Him in His temple? Romans 12, 1 and 2, after Paul spends 11 chapters talking to them about the grace of God, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, by His mercy on you who are broken sinners, that you present, and that says the same word, peristomai, that you yield. Here it's translated present your bodies, yield your bodies, submit your bodies, be that piece of clay that's malleable and moldable in God's hands. That you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Don't keep crawling off the wheel to live your life your way. But alive but yet given to God as a sacrifice to use however he would choose to use it. Acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. And don't be conformed anymore to this world. See, that's what you're, you're letting the world shape you. You're being conformed to the way the world would have you to be. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, a yielded vessel in the hands of the potter to be molded to the design that he has on your life because he made you alive from the dead and he bought you with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Anyway, so Paul goes on then in Romans 9, or to go back to Romans 9, 22, 24, makes an amazing statement. He says, but who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Now picture that piece of clay uh, that is telling God how to mold it. Who are you, O man, to talk to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? You know, those pieces of clay that refuses to be yielded and are on the potter's wheel and just keep arguing with God over and over again, denying their sin and their immorality, but with great patience, he keeps trying. So, so what if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, his grace, whom he prepared in advance for glory? He wants to shape us for glory, but some of those vessels just want to argue with him and be shaped by the world. But doesn't he have a right to shape us any way he wants to shape us? Even as him who called you, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. Is not the potter sovereign in how he shapes the clay and how he chooses to use it? Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9.17, 
and this is interesting, he says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, submission, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself might be a castaway, a throwaway. Now, wait a minute. This is the Apostle Paul. You know, we read his life uh, and, and his works and, and the story of Paul and his missionary journeys and his imprisonments. Man, he's like the greatest Christian that ever was. But yet, he feared that he really kept his body yielded, kept it into submission or subjection to God, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away, thrown away, that he couldn't perform the purpose for which he was created. You know, I've got a, uh, right here in my drawer, in my desk that I'm sitting at, I've got all kinds of pens and pencils. And I don't know why, but I have this habit is, is, is I'll, I'll get a pen out of my, my uh, 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 cup here, right? And it's a pretty pen. It's a nice pen. I, I remember where I got this pen, the person who gave it to me. And, 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 and I go to write with it and it doesn't write. And, you know, you hit it, you know, and, and, and uh, sometimes I've tried that where you, you heat the end of it up and it doesn't write. But instead of throwing it away, a castaway, what do I do? I put it in the drawer because maybe someday, I don't know, it's too pretty to throw away. And maybe someday uh, I'll, I'll reach for it. And sure enough, you know, a few months from now, a few weeks from now, I'll be looking for a pen. Can't find one uh, in, in, in my uh, coffee cup. And I'll reach in this drawer and I'll pull that thing out again. And I'll try it again. But it doesn't, it doesn't do what it was created to do again. But it's so pretty. And, you know, maybe someday something happens. I don't know. I just, for some reason, I just throw it back in the drawer. Down the line, I take it out again and, and pop it open. And, and I finally, I've had it. I needed to write. Somebody's on the phone. i got to write something down. It has failed me too many times and has not performed the purpose for which it was created. And so I'm going to throw it away. Finally. Poof. Throw it in the trash can. That's what Paul is saying. He feared that he might be a throwaway, a castaway, that God would go to use him and he would not perform the function for which he was created. So he kept his body into submission. Again, in the NIV, it puts it this way. I was reading from the, from the King James Version, used the word castaway. He says, no, I beat my body and make it my slave. That is submission. I make it yielded and malleable so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize, is the NIV. Now, that's a nice way of saying castaway. That I myself will not be disqualified. That word castaway is the word adakimos. Dokimos means approved. Adakimos means disapproved. Rejected. No good. Cast away. In fact, to kind of use an illustration, there was a, a time in Greece, or actually in, in, in uh, that vessels that were made and were fired in the kiln, uh, that if they had lumps in it, those lumps generally caused cracks, and then that vase would not be any good. But those vases that, that were approved and went through the fire of testing and, and were solid and good vases that could hold wine or olive oil or water, whatever they were used for, were written on the bottom of them. Guess what? Dokimos. Approved. It had been through the fire. This vessel can perform the function for which it, is, it was made. Therefore, it can be sold in the marketplace as a good jar or vase or bowl or whatever it was, and it will do what it was made to do. The adakimas, those that were rejected that had cracks, did not get dakimas written on their vase, were thrown out. A pile of pottery, because there was some use in using pot sherds for different, for different things. But they were cast away. And that's what he's saying. Paul says, I keep my body and make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize rejected, have adakimas stamped on my life. I would rather be dakimas approved. In fact, that's what he told young Timothy, using the same word, dakimas. 2 Timothy 2.15, study, to tow thyself approved, dakimas unto God. Give yourself to Scripture. Yield your life to the Holy Spirit and to the God's Word so that God can shape you, Timothy, and make you into the young man He would have you to be, that preacher, to go out and to minister the gospel that you might be stamped dokimos. Approved. A vessel that can perform the function from which God would have it to do. The reason that it was made and shaped out of the clay. Approved. 
not cast away, not adakimas. And this is a beautiful word picture for us, but there's also something to fear that even the Apostle Paul had to work at his submission because he feared that he couldn't perform the function that God had created him for and he too would be cast away. Adakimas. So secondly, look at the clay jar. This is what the Lord says, go and buy a clay jar from the potter. So he's at the potter's house on this field trip with God. He says, buy a pot. Okay, one of those ones that was Dakimas, you know, he's got this good pot. Take some of the elders of the people and the priests and go out to the valley of Ben Hinnom near the entrance to the potsherd gate. Now the potsherd gates where they threw out all the broken pottery. So there's this big pile or heap, if you can picture it, going down the hillside there of all these broken pots. Those pots that were cast away, that, that could no longer fulfill their function and were thrown out piled up in a big heap. There proclaim with all that pottery the words that I tell you. Thirdly, we have that ex in this explanation of that. The reason that he's got them there is because they have forsaken me and they have made this a place that is Jerusalem and the temple of foreign gods. They let the world shape them. They let the countries uh, and the gods of those countries round about them shape them. And they wouldn't be shaped by God. They had un uh, unmoldable places in their lives. For they have forsaken and made this place a place of foreign gods. They have, blamed, they have burned sacrifices in it to gods that neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah ever knew. And they have filled this place with the blood of the innocent. They have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as offerings to Baal something I did not command or even mention, nor did it ever enter my mind. They're following the idols and the false religious practices and those traditions of their day, being molded by those things, letting the nations around them shape them rather than be shaped by God. Instead of simply yielding to the potter's hand to become the people that God would have them to be. So fourthly, then we say, and say to them, this is what the Lord Almighty says in verse 11, I will smash this nation. I wonder if that time, you know, in this picture, if, if Jeremiah wasn't to throw down that jar on that pile of potsherds and break it. See, God is saying, say to them, this is what the Lord Almighty says, I will smash this nation. And this city, just as a potter's jar is smashed, and it cannot be repaired. I'm going to smash this nation beyond repair. It wouldn't yield to me. I made them. I'm the potter. I shaped them the way I would have them to be, but they would not be shaped by me. So they're dakimas. They're not dakimas. They're adakimas. Disapproved. Cast away. Broken. On that pile of pottery. They will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no more room. Scary. And it's meant to be. It's meant to get their attention because they refuse to listen. So God gave them this visual aid that maybe they'll see what God is going to do if they won't listen by Jeremiah what God said he's going to do. You either yield to the potter, that beautiful word, submit to him and let him fashion you, a workman that is dakimos approved. Or are you going to be thrown out the gates? And the city itself is going to be destroyed. You'll be rejected. Cast away. Because you will not perform the function for which God created you to perform. The potter created you to perform. And does not the potter have the right to do that? He made you. He breathed into that clay called Adam, Adama, the clay. The breath of life. Wouldn't it be better just to yield? just to be that living sacrifice, just to submit, to give him every piece of, let, let, let him find every piece of that lump and, and let it, let it, let it uh, not be lumpy, those areas of our life that we don't want to give to God or unpack before God. Let him go ahead and have them. Cut out those, those lumps or, or mash them in so that it's the same texture of the rest of the clay so he can shape us the way that he would. That's where true joy comes in, is fulfilling the purpose for which our Creator created us. Of being Dakimas.
God has an immutable law of justice. He is a just God. And he says in Galatians, be not deceived, because many are deceived. Oh, God's really not going to destroy this city, they were saying. I mean, we're God's people. God's not going to cast away us. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You wouldn't yield to my hands. You wouldn't submit. You kept arguing with me on the potter's wheel. I would take you out to the potter's gate and throw you away. And then destroy the city. Hosea, this puts it this way. Sometimes in Hosea 8, 7, Hosea expounded upon that. He says, for they who sow to the wind, I mean, going out and you, you cast that seed to the wind, they're going to reap a whirlwind. See, now that you reap what you sow, sometimes you out so carelessly sowing your seed everywhere like they did, you, you're going to reap a whirlwind. It's going to be worse. You're going to reap more than what you sowed. And then finally in verse 15, we have again the call that God has been calling them all along. Listen. Just listen. But how many people are listening to God's word today? How many people listen to God? Take time to prayer, to pray and to meditate and to consider God, to listen to his voice in scripture. Listen. This is what the Lord, and that's the word Yahweh, that potter. This is what the potter says, who has the power over the clay to do whatever he wants because it's his clay. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, listen, I am going to bring on this city and the villages around it every disaster I pronounced against them. See, because they didn't believe it. Because they were stiff-necked, they were lumpy clay. They wouldn't yield to the potter's hands. And they would not listen to my world, to my word. Would not listen to my words. Wow. Refusing to yield, or well, they yielded to the gods around them. They yield to the foreign gods of the world, but they wouldn't yield to God, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't listen. So now it comes time for that vessel to be broken and to be thrown out the gate on a pile of broken pottery to be cast away. Conclusion is simple. We need to listen to God's words, and we need to yield to Him. Submit every area of our life to Him to make and to shape us into His beautiful piece of artwork, however He would design us to be, that we might find that the greatest joy is having Dakima stomped on our lives, stamped on our lives, that we were able to perform the purpose for which God had prepared us to perform. And even like I said, the great Apostle Paul, uh, he worked to yield his body, to keep it in a state of yieldedness, submissiveness, lest by any means after he had preached to others, he might no longer be of use to the Lord and be cast away. Listen and yield. And it all begins with those ABCs, agreeing with God that we're sinners. We are so broken. I mean, we're that, most, most days we're that little piece of clay that, that, that God the potter is trying to shape and we're sitting there arguing with God. <laughs> so, so prideful, so defiant. You know, I don't want to be this way. I don't want to do that. I want to live this way. I want to do this. I, you know, we want to live our life according to the way the world would shape us. We keep crawling off the wheel every chance we get. And yet God in his mercy and his graciousness keeps picking us up and putting it back on and trying to, 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 to help that, uh, those lumpy parts that we refuse to yield to become part of the whole, that we might make it through the trials of the furnace and be approved. Agree with God that we're broken and sinners. Humble ourselves before him. And then believe. Believe that he did for us what he said he did in our sinful, defiant prideful condition that while we were yet sinners you know strutting around uh, a little piece of clay on that potter's wheel thinking we're really hot stuff that christ died for us redeemed us from the furnace of hell saved us but we were saved for a purpose and that was to see confess him as lord let him be the potter put ourselves where we begin where we belong is yielded a living sacrifice yielded into the hands of the one who redeemed us with his very own blood and let him make and shape us and confess him as Lord, absolute sovereign over every area of our lives, over area, every lump that we refuse to give up, giving those lumps up 
that God may use us the way that he would have us to be. God bless you.